So today I want to talk about rail companies granting paid sick days to railway workers. Now, near the end of 2022, rail workers in the United States were on the verge of striking because railroad companies refused to budge on the workers' biggest demands, namely paid sick leave and, of course, proper work scheduling that addressed the issues present in the railroad industry's so-called precision-scheduled railroading. Of course, despite all of this, Congress and President Biden forced a contract onto workers, which excluded these two very important demands. And when we fast forward to February of 2023, we saw firsthand what happens when the needs of workers are ignored and profit motivation and stock buybacks are prioritized over safety concerns when we witnessed several train derailments, including the one in East Palestine, Ohio, which I remind you all, has caused untold environmental and community damage. Now, after all of that, it may come as a surprise to some of you to learn that the railway industry has actually decided to grant four paid sick days to almost half the workforce. Now, naturally, these companies didn't do this of their own volition, but instead did it thanks to the work of unions, the struggle of workers, and public pressure largely due to the level of negative publicity that was generated, both by the conditions that workers faced, the upcoming strike that was pending in uh, November, and of course the disaster in East Palestine, Ohio. That said, this is objectively good news, and we should take a moment to pause and celebrate that. Even if I feel that the workers should be getting far more paid sick days than just four days, at least a week and probably a lot more would be definitely on the table. With that in mind, this is definitely something worth taking a moment to celebrate, even if the struggle is not over and even if we want to see more in the future. The idea that media attention, public outrage, and workers unionizing and speaking out could create and affect change in a decades-long struggle to attempt to get sick days for these workers provides a concrete example of the power of people coming together against corporations, and it also speaks volumes about how shared information in our modern era could become easier if we weren't getting pushback. Now, as Greg Reagan, president of the Transportation Trades Department at the AFL-CIO, puts it, the rail companies miscalculated about how the public would see their huge profits and the stories of how hard rail workers' lives were, and not having sick days and the draconian policies they were operating under. Now, of course, this victory is only a start. And there are other issues that need to be addressed when it comes to the industry, the role that government plays in all of this, and the way that the media has talked about and conversed about this topic. Now, first and foremost, we need to address that while, again, all of this is an objective good, from the industry's position, not from the workers, it is purely damage control. And as a locomotive engineer and organizer at the activist group Rail Workers United has put it, it's a little disingenuous for the railroads to suddenly make nice. They eased up on paid sick days because the American people learned that their massive stock buybacks and their budget cuts and the staffing cuts that probably played into the train wreck in East Palestine, Ohio, which badly hurt their image. So with that in mind, essentially, this is an attempt by the industry to fix their image and to try to get the public to stop paying attention to the other issues involved by providing a small victory for the workers. By doing this, it makes it look like they're starting to address the issues, which means it's something we don't need to focus on in the industry's mind, when in reality, a lot more needs to be done, and we need to remain constantly vigilant and continue to support these workers throughout all of these negotiations, which include factors like the fact that several other uh, unions are still in negotiations for their paid sick time. Additionally, The industry needs to address sincere safety issues, such as if a carman who inspects and repairs rail cars has to call in sick and doesn't come into work, the train will still run. Now think about that for a moment. If somebody who is sick 
does not come in to inspect the railway cars, then the train will still run. That is absurd, and that is a huge safety risk. There should be people that they can call on. There should be ways around that. The fact of the matter is that that is a huge safety concern. Add to that the fact that there's no regulation on the industry when it comes to things like the temperatures that trains run at, or a mandate to have ECP brakes when uh, there is some sort of dangerous chemical or material being carried on the train. Both of which, of course, might have mitigated the disaster in East Palestine, Ohio, had they been implemented. Further, none of this even begins to address the issues that are involved with precision scheduled railroading. The firing of the 40,000 workers that occurred just before the pandemic or any of the other ways that the industry has harmed and hurt workers. The point I'm trying to make in all of this is that the battle is not over, and public outrage needs to be maintained against the industry for things to continue to get better for workers. It worked in this case, and it can continue to work in the future. Now next, I want to address very briefly the role of the federal government in all of this. The federal government, in my mind, is just as culpable as the railroad industry by choosing to force the workers into this contract rather than force regulations onto the industry. They have worked hand-in-hand -hand with the railroad industry through all of this deregulation by allowing extensive lobbying and allowing the industry to get away with so much of what they do without it ever being addressed or pushed by the federal government. Now, despite this, the Biden administration and Pete Buttigieg have, of course, been trying to claim this as their victory. We see here that the White House has actually taken some credit for the advances on paid sick days. Uh, they've put out all sorts of things as early as February, talking about how they were going to stop this and fix things and everything of that sort. So they are trying to take a victory lap on all of this while acting as if they were not complicit in this during all of it, and if they weren't complicit in this during the negotiation of the contract that was enforced onto transportation workers. Uh, additionally, we need to keep in mind that the transportation secretary is responsible to address the profit over safety approach to running trains, which means Pete Buttigieg really hasn't been doing his job and suddenly cares you know, when it's advantageous. It's really hard to give the federal government credit in all this when they allowed for and exacerbated the problems involved until things became politically advantageous for them to do otherwise. And they could take the credit of the work that unions and people had done in order to boost their standing. And finally, uh, you may have noticed that in covering this today, I have relied exclusively on one article. This article from The Guardian, U.S. Rail Companies Grant Paid Sick Days uh, After Public Pressure in Win for Unions. This is the only article that I have been able to find. As of May 3rd, when this is being recorded, I have found literally no major U.S. news outlets covering this story that The Guardian had covered on May 1st. The only exception was immediately after the disaster in East Palestine, Ohio, a few smaller outlets had discussed that Norfolk Southern had offered sick days to some of its workers after the disaster. But no word from any other media source that half the industry has followed suit. This may change on the day of this being uploaded or on a future date, but as of this time, it has only been The Guardian, a UK news source, and a few smaller sites that I'm generally unfamiliar with, like Trains.com and, and a few other places that generally are not what we would consider major U.S. news outlets that have begun to cover this. And the question I have is, why? And that's an important question to be asking, because the unfortunate reality is a lot of our media is owned by people who make a lot of profit off of uh, the industry. And the railway industry is very much tied to finances and Wall Street and all that. So it makes sense that some of these media outlets may not, in fact, want to provide some of the information if it doesn't benefit their bottom line. And while I cannot possibly know the full extent and answer to why this is the case, 
I have to speculate that part of this is tied to the fact that the story in East Palestine, Ohio, actively negatively uh, impacted finances and impacted negative publicity towards the railroad industry and may have actually helped inform people that there was in fact an issue to be angry about in the first place. And another part of me believes that when this eventually is addressed, that it will need a certain spin onto it in order to make the industry and the government not look as horrible due to the financial interests at play. Now, if you go back and you look at a lot of the articles from when the strike in the U.S. was imminent, many of the articles actually shifted blame and responsibility and blamed the economic damage that could have been caused, the $2 billion or so dollars that could have happened per day if the workers had struck, on the workers rather than the industry. The framing posed the workers as villains, and this happens quite often. And I may in fact take some time later in another video to talk about this, if there's interest in that, and go back and look at some of those articles as a lesson in propaganda in the near future, uh, because this type of thing really does happen more often than we may all realize. And it's important to be able to identify it and to be able to talk about what it is that the articles are framing and who they're framing as the heroes and the villains in the respective stories that they write. That said, I do think with all of the things that I've addressed here, I still think we should take a moment to celebrate this as a win, while also recognizing that there is a lot more to be done in the industry when it comes to what they have to give up to the workers. Short of us reaching a point where the workers are in charge of their own industry, I don't think I will ever let up and stop. That said, whatever the U.S. media outlets end up reporting on this, I think we need to center public outcry and union workers and leadership in conversations surrounding this topic and the ways that we get stuff done in other areas where we have seen major uh, inroads into changes in industry standards. And not just let financial interests and the railroad industry, as well as the government, make themselves the hero of a story in which they have colluded together as villains. So with that said, if you've learned something here today, consider liking the video, subscribing, and leaving a comment, as well as consider joining my Discord where we continue to have conversations like these. If you're in a financial place to do so, and only if you're in a financial place to do so, please do consider supporting me on Patreon, especially as political content like this can often be demonetized on YouTube, and it goes a long way to helping me continue to create these videos. The links for everything that I mentioned are in the description down below. With that said, my name is Anarchist Tara. Thank you so much for watching.